From imminent threat to deterrence, the U.S. shifts its narrative to justify the killing of Iran's top general, now saying it was part of a bigger strategy. But does the Trump administration have a coherent policy on Iran, and where does it lead? Hello and welcome to Bigger Than Five with me, Rida Fakhri. The tense standoff between the United States and Iran continues following the assassination of Iran's top general, Qasem Soleimani, in Iraq earlier this month. Iran retaliated by striking a U.S. military base in Iraq. And now, while both sides seem to have stepped back from the brink of direct confrontation, they face mounting criticism at home over their handling of the situation. Last week, U.S. President Donald Trump justified his decision to order the killing of Iran's general, claiming that Soleimani posed an imminent threat to U.S. embassies in the region. At my direction, the United States military eliminated the world's top terrorist, Qasem Soleimani. In recent days, he was planning new attacks on American targets, but we stopped him. He should have been terminated long ago. By removing Soleimani, we have sent a powerful message to terrorists. If you value your own life, you will not threaten the lives of our people. Trump also introduced a new set of sanctions against Tehran, but his administration has yet to present any concrete evidence to support the claim that Soleimani posed an imminent threat to the United States. Democrats and some Republicans in Congress have sharply criticized the Trump administration over this issue. The failure to consult with our allies or Congress and the reckless disregard for the consequences that would surely follow was, in my view, dangerously incompetent. Just as we were led into Vietnam and Iraq by lies, the Trump administration is misleading us on Iran. They have justified the assassination of Qasim Soleimani by claiming that he was planning imminent attacks on hundreds of Americans in the region, and yet they produce no evidence that would justify this claim, not even in a classified setting. I am questioning whether or not the Trump administration has a coherent strategy for what to do next. Uh, I think it's important that we consult with our allies in the region, um, that the president consult with Congress, and that he put forward a clear strategy for how to de-escalate this particular situation so we do not end up stumbling into another large-scale war in the Middle East. Amid the fallout, the Democratic majority U.S. House of Representatives passed a bill limiting the U.S. president's authority to use military force against Iran. Three Republicans voted in favor of the bill. And on Monday, the Trump administration's initial narrative shifted again from imminent threat to deterrence and self-defense. This was a legitimate act of, of self-defense because it disrupted ongoing attacks that uh, were being conducted, a campaign against uh, the Americans, and it reestablished deterrence. It responded to uh, attacks that had been uh, already committed. Well, the president didn't say there was a tangible. Uh, he didn't cite a specific piece of evidence. What he said is he probably he believed. Are you saying there wasn't been. one? I didn't see one with regard to four embassies. So, as Iran and the U.S. continue to weigh their options, what are the broader implications for the region, and does the U.S. have a coherent strategy? Our scheduled interview earlier today with the U.S. State Department's representative for Iran, Brian Hook, was cancelled at the last minute as the Trump administration seems to be trying to present a unified position on Iran. Joining us now to discuss this is Thomas Pickering, former Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs and former U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations. Ambassador Pickering, clearly the United States uh, administration is changing its tune when it comes to the justification of Soleimani's killing, going from an imminent threat now to the idea that this was part of a bigger strategy of deterrence. Was it the lack of any compelling evidence? Or was it really uh, the fact that Soleimani may have been a good deterrent? The compelling evidence seems to be absent, and our friends in the Congress who apparently have heard it have consistently said that it isn't there. The second question is, is there a strategy? One, in many ways, has to be very skeptical about whether there is a strategy for dealing with Iraq. The strategy mainly seems to be Trump's compelling urge to speak with Rouhani at some point and to resolve the problem, perhaps with a big bang agenda. Uh, and Rouhani isn't having any of it in large measure because Iran believes it has 
serious reasons to distrust the United States. But what, what are the signs that the United States has any genuine interest in negotiating with the Iranians? I think that increasingly we see skepticism on the part of the people around the president, while at the same time, the president himself seems to be, in one way or another, in a kind of mirror image of his approach to Kim Jong-un in North Korea, uh, completely fascinated by the idea that he will be the man who will save the world uh, by making the best deal possible ever conceivable with Iran. Certainly, one wonders with great doubt about this particular possibility. And indeed, since it seems to be frequently buttressed by what are, and for every sense of the word, uh, untruths in justifying the U.S. policy, uh, this doesn't seem in any way at all to qualify as a strategy. It has no clear U.S. national objective. It has no sense of priority. It has no sense of program. It is more or less what the president wakes up and tweets about that is driving it. So do you see it the way some members of Congress see this? They say that Brian Hook and other administration officials act bellicose first and then attempt to analyze later. Is that how you would characterize the, their approach to, to this whole situation? You're right, but I think they are in many ways pygmy images of the way the president responds. The president seems to be in many ways super fascinated with New York real estate negotiations, where you go in with the biggest possible bluff and the hardest amount of criticism and indeed pressure, and you put your toughest position on the table and you see what you can get as a result of that. And if you can't get anything, you walk out of the room. And that isn't done in international relations because it doesn't work. The people who walk out of the room on are the people you're going to have to continue to deal with in your country for the rest of your time in office. And this, this goes far beyond walking out of the room. What was at stake for the United States, do you believe? Why take out Soleimani on the day he was set to meet with the prime minister of Iraq, who told parliament that, in fact, Soleimani was bringing back a message from the Iranians in response to the message that the Iraqis had delivered to the Saudis? Why scuttle these negotiations? I think that there probably was little interest in those negotiations. And there was much more interest in how and in what way could the president, in a kind of wag the dog moment, when he was under great pressure uh, for the question of impeachment, change the subject. And many have said this was something long planned and had been in the works for a great period of time. And it was one of those things that was looked like as the Obama-Osama moment. Uh, and he wanted to do better. And I think some of that was driving this particular question. Although, in the end, the historians will have to tell us precisely what went on. We don't have, at this stage, enough information to do other than to do as you and I are guessing uh, and dialoguing about uh, in terms of what motivates Trump and where the process is going. But if we can do just a little bit of guessing, Ambassador Pickering, some historians have pointed out to the fact that the world has changed dramatically in the last a few years from uh, previous decades when the United States set up all of these military bases across the region. It has about 800 military bases in more than 70 countries compared to 12 bases that the French have, 12 that the British have, and nine that the Russians maintain. Uh, can the United States continue to keep its military presence in the region when clearly some countries do not want it? What my view has been for a long time, and the Iraq war and the Afghan war, I think, are firm and, and, and important underpinnings for that view, that military processes don't often easily and quickly uh, satisfy diplomatic uh, imperatives, solve diplomatic problems. And we see that as we have been going along. Admittedly, and I would be the last to say the military doesn't count, of course it counts. And it's very important. It's one of the things that can bring leverage uh, to a diplomatic position, which no diplomat, I think, would, in, in any sense of the word, wish to put aside and say we should run purely on the question of diplomatic leverage. 
But it is important, I think, to have communications, even with your enemies. It's important to look at ways to solve these problems. But, 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 but hold on, Ambassador. Is it important to, to respect the sovereignty of your allies? I mean, the Iraqi parliament itself voted uh, for the U.S. troops to leave the country. Can you say that you support the people of the region without respecting their sovereignty? Well, the parliament recommended to the prime minister uh, that he ask the Americans to go. And the prime minister has to make that ultimate decision, and I think he's very troubled by it. Uh, so that is not a done deal in that regard. But diplomatically, the nuclear agreement, while not perfect, has gotten us much further than all of the bluster and the mistakes, the military activity of the Trump administration. All right, Ambassador Thomas Pickering, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's great to be with you. So that was The View from Washington. For The View Now from Tehran, I'm joined by Syed Mohammed Marandi, professor of English Literature and Orientalism at the University of Tehran. Professor Marandi, the U.S. administration is sending many conflicting and confusing signals. But does Iran have a more coherent strategy? Well, Iran's strategy has always been consistent. When it comes to the nuclear deal, the Iranians will accept nothing less than the full implementation. And the Iranians have been abiding by its commitments for a year and a half after the Americans withdrew and after the Europeans, under American pressure, discontinued their, uh, ob their commitments to the deal. But if we look at the situation of the last few days, uh, the killing of General Soleimani, the response of the Iranians, and then the uh, changing of the narratives, both here in Washington, but also in Tehran when it comes to the shooting and the circumstances of the shooting of the Ukrainian plane. Uh, was Iran, was the government straightforward with the public? Did it, did it miss an opportunity? Did it fumble an opportunity to rally support against this killing and to look like the victim of U.S. aggression? No, Iran is definitely the victim. I wouldn't be fooled by the Western media here. Uh, seven, five to seven million people took part in General Soleimani's uh, funeral. And the fact that a thousand people in Tehran uh, protested and tore General Soleimani's poster doesn't make this a change in mood in Tehran. I think this is wishful thinking on behalf of the Americans. It has come out that the, uh, despite the assertions of the Persian language, Western-funded and Western-owned media like BBC Persian, Deutsche Welle Persian, VOA Persian, and Iran International funded by Saudi Arabia, where they initially peddled the conspiracy theory that the Iranians were hiding the truth. Now people in Iran are beginning to see the reality that the Iranians from the day one invited international teams, such as from Ukraine, to see the evidence, and the Iranians protected the black box. And also, it's now becoming clear that the transponder for the Ukrainian airplane was off. But let's be honest, though. The Iranian government did not come out and say it as it was at the beginning. I mean, they reluctantly had to come out and say that they inadvertently shot down the plane. Initially, they said it was a technical malfunction. So they weren't straight with the Iranian public from the beginning, were they? And didn't that um, amount to the fact that the tide, the public outrage against Soleimani's killing, s slowly shifted and, and became more of a resentment toward the Iranian government for its handling of the whole situation? No, that's, that's not true. The Iranian government, the miscommunication that existed between the military, which was carrying out an internal investigation, and the government existed, and that is something that angered people. But it, initially, because these Persian language media outlets fun, funded by Western governments were peddling the conspiracy theory that there was a cover-up, many people got angry. But as time went by, people recognized that there was no conspiracy theory because the Iranian government had all, had, and the military invited foreign investigators to come in immediately. If they were going to cover up, they wouldn't have invited them. And also, the Iranians could have destroyed the black box, saying that it was destroyed in the crash, but they preserved it. So people now recognize that this, uh, this narrative is not true. I wouldn't too put too much faith in what we hear in the Western media. That What they've been saying about Iran has been going on for the last 
40 years. Their, their caricature re of reality is exactly that which hurts them because they base their calculations upon wishful thinking and uh, their narratives that uh, are not based on reality. So you say it's all caricature and it's all uh, propaganda driven by the West, but there are people on the streets of Tehran protesting against the government and its handling of this whole situation. You've been tweeting and saying that Iran is calm and things are normal. Is it really? And what is the Iranian government's calculation? What does it do next? It chose to retaliate in a very limited way. Was it trying to avoid direct conflict with the United States? And what do you say to the Europeans now putting pressure on the government with 60 days to go to get back into the Iran nuclear deal and to abide by all of its uh, clauses? Well, first of all, Tehran is very quiet. And I think uh, inviting the Iranian guests on television that are paid by the U.S. government and their names are on the State Department list of people receiving funds, I think that that helps produce a false narrative. Iran is calm, Iran is quiet, and the government and the people all blame the United States more than anyone else for this tragedy. But with regards to the Europeans, it's the Iranians that have been abiding by their commitments, not the EU. The EU has been in violation of their commitments within the framework of the JCPOA, and it's very outrageous and very arrogant for them to expect the Iranians to continue abiding by their commitments when the Europeans are in full violation. So if the Europeans leave the deal, it's fine for Iran, because we've already been under sanctions that go far beyond any beyond anything that uh, can now that will be returned uh, as a part of uh, the collapse of the deal. Professor Saeed Mohammed Mirandi, thank you very much for joining us from Tehran. Tensions between Iran and the U.S. have almost always played out through their allies and proxies in the Middle East. The recent direct confrontation between the two countries took place in Iraq, where Soleimani was killed just outside Baghdad's international airport. The Ain al-Assad U.S. military base, which was hit by Iran, is also located in Iraq's Anbar region in the western part of the country. Now, over the years, both sides have expanded their presence and influence in the region. The United States has 50 to 60,000 troops, not including military or civilian contractors, across the Middle East. They're stationed in military bases in Kuwait, Jordan, Egypt, the UAE, Qatar, and Bahrain, which host the U.S. Navy's fifth fleet. Iran has cultivated its own military alliances in Syria through its close ties with Bashar al-Assad's government, in Iraq through a number of pro-Iran militias, in Lebanon through Hezbollah's military and political influence, and in Yemen through the Houthis. So given the U.S.'s military footprint and Iran's influence across the region, will the stability of countries continue to depend on the fluctuating tensions between both sides? Joining me to discuss, Ali Vaez, Iran Project Director at the International Crisis Group, and Matthew Kranig, Deputy Director at the Schoolcroft Center for Strategy and Security. He was also a special advisor on Iran policy in the Office of the Secretary of Defense. Ali Vaez, both sides seem, for now at least, have chosen to de-escalate. But with this huge military presence that they each have in the region, how is this likely to play out? Well, look, this is at best a pause in the cycle of escalation that we have witnessed in the past few months. In fact, Iran and the U.S. have come to the brink of a military confrontation three times in the past seven months. And I think as long as the main factor, the main element that has created this dynamic, which is the Trump administration's maximum pressure policy, is in place and the administration continues to double down on it, the Iranians will continue with their nuclear escalation. Every 60 days, they will reduce their compliance with the nuclear deal and with the regional ex escalation by going after U.S. Uh, assets and U.S. interests uh, in the region, as well as U.S. allies. And there's plenty of them in Absolutely. terms of assets, allies, and, and, and bases and, and the likes, uh, Matthew Quinning. So putting aside the legal aspects of the U.S. strike, the fact that it happened, it's what many people would consider an extrajudicial killing on a foreign sovereign soil, and that we're talking about Iran's top general, a senior official within the government. How does the assassination of General Soleimani affect the U.S.'s interests in the region and its allies as well? Well, I, I think it's uh, important to point out that um, uh, General Soleimani has uh, killed hundreds uh, of Americans uh, over the years, according to the Pentagon, uh, leads Iran's terror and proxy networks uh, across the region, destabilizing Syria, Yemen, um, uh, Iraq and uh, uh, much of the region. Uh, so I don't think we should uh, cry uh, over his demise. 
Um, and I do think it is part of the uh, Trump administration's broader maximum pressure strategy, uh, trying to force Iran to come to the table uh, to discuss limits on its nuclear program, on its illegal ballistic missile program, on its support for terror. Uh, the beginning of the administration, this was primarily an economic warfare uh, strategy. Well, but clearly it isn't working because the U.S. wouldn't have taken this step. You say that he has killed hundreds of people. The Iranians could easily turn around as well and say that he is a military commander. The United States itself, with all of its different um, assets in the region, has also, in fact, engaged in warfare and has killed many people across the region. Well, I don't think it makes sense to equate Iran and the United States. Iran is the leading state sponsor of terror. Uh, according to the U.S. State Department, it has an illegal ballistic missile program according uh, under multiple U.N. Security Council resolutions. And it's its nuclear program that's the cause of this major crisis, uh, not the Trump maximum pressure strategy. So the Trump administration is trying to bring Iran to the table, first through economic pressure, and now it's showing that the military option uh, is also on the table to increase the pressure on Iran. I advise your views is the maximum pressure campaign, as it's called, these punishing uh, sanctions that the U.S. Uh, has imposed on Iran, have they been working? And, and would, would the United States have taken this measure if they had been? Look, three years ago, uh, Iran's nuclear program was uh, under block and under the most rigorous uh, inspection regime ever implemented anywhere in the world. Uh, now it's bleeding. The nuclear agreement is bleeding and Iran is ramping up its nuclear program again. Uh, three years ago, Iran, it was really impossible to imagine Iran uh, firing uh, ballistic missiles into U.S. bases in Iraq, uh, which now has happened. Three years ago, it was impossible to imagine that the Iranians would facilitate an attack on Saudi oil infrastructure or target shipping in the Persian Gulf. All of this has happened precisely as a result and consequence of the maximum pressure strategy. And you know, it's, it's easy for other countries in the world, and in fact, the Iranians have already designated CENTCOM and U.S. military forces in the region as terrorist organizations. And if they are to also go and assassinate U.S. commanders and generals in the region, and other countries do the same to their own adversaries, it will be the rule of jungle. So there's that problem, but given what we now know, Matthew Krennic, that the United States says that uh, the killing of Soleimani was more to do with deterrence than it was with an imminent threat, completely flip-flopping on the issue. I mean, several uh, U.S. Uh, officials have had a hard time over the last couple of days in justifying this action, initially saying there was an imminent threat, and now finally saying, no, it was all part of a, a deterrence strategy, a bigger strategy. Uh, does this move make any strategic sense now for the United States? Well, I think this has been a weakness of this administration of uh, having clear strategic communications. Uh, but, but in my view, the, end, the uh, move had both uh, effects. Uh, I, I think it's very likely, I didn't see the intelligence, but very likely that uh, Soleimani was planning attacks on uh, American assets. Uh, after you say all, you he didn't see the intelligence. The defense secretary says he didn't see the evidence either. Do you think there was evidence? to suggest I, I, that there I think was an imminent threat. I, I think it's almost certain that uh, Soleimani was planning attacks on American interests around the region. That's what he's been doing uh, for decades. So I, I think there likely were imminent threats. And I do think it was a matter of deterrence. Iran uh, showed that it was willing to attack and kill Americans. And President Trump said, no, this is a red line for me. Uh, if you kill Americans, I'll use uh, force. And I think um, it has deterred subsequent attacks um, uh, against Americans. I think the attack uh, on the base and response was more of a token uh, response, not looking uh, to cause large-scale large, large scale damage. So my hope is that deterrence uh, has been restored. A token response or a strategic response, Ali, as you say, to drive out the United States. And we just heard the Iraqi parliament the other day uh, took a vote to drive the U.S. troops remaining in the country out of that country. So clearly it wasn't just a token move, was it? Look, in the past 40 years, the Iranians have never dared directly targeting a U.S. Uh, a base housing U.S. forces, which happened after uh, Soleimani's assassination. So I don't know how deterrence has been restored, right? But they could have gone further. They, they chose not to. They could have gone further, and I think they will go further. I'm not sure if they're done with their reprisal. Uh, as I said, there will be different elements to it. Strategically, they will try to push the U.S. out of their backyard. Uh, but uh, I'm sure there will also be uh, additional attacks, attempts at uh, maybe assassinating senior U.S. officials in the region at a time that they believe the risks of a backlash are limited because the U.S. is bogged down in another international crisis or in another domestic crisis. How do you see this playing out? 
Well, I think um, it, it has de-escalated in the, the near term, but I do, um, I do think one of the most significant ways Iran has retaliated is by announcing that it's uh, ceasing compliance with the Iran nuclear deal, that it will begin ramping up its nuclear program. Uh, the best outside experts estimate that Iran's nuclear breakout time is six to eight months. Uh, so that's uh, why I say I think six to eight months from now we might be back here having another conversation of uh, are we willing to live with a nuclear armed Iran or will we take military action to stop it or does being on the brink of a major conflict uh, lead all parties to come to the negotiating table uh, to discuss new uh, nuclear limits. An open question for now it seems. Matthew Krenning and Ali Baez, thank you both very much. So for now, the two sides may have diffused tensions and avoided an all-out war, despite the Trump administration's gamble in carrying out Soleimani's brazen assassination. But as long-term battle lines are drawn, Washington and Tehran will be working to keep their strategic alliances at a time of great uncertainty and heightened tensions in an already volatile region. From Miri Dafakhri and all the team here in Washington, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.